good morning. We're going to get going. Uh, today it's my really distinct pleasure to introduce to you Anat Kessler. Uh, Anat is uh, a colleague and a good friend of mine who is the head of neuro-ophthalmology at the Tel Aviv Medical Center, and she's a professor of neurology and works in the ophthalmology department at the uh, Tel Aviv University. Uh, Anat has uh, published um, over 100 articles, and a lot of them have to do with pseudotumor cerebri, which is one of her passions and uh, areas of study. Anat is one of the people who've put into the literature uh, the different types of obesity, and I know she's going to be covering uh, that today uh, in her lecture. And so we're very pleased to have Anat Kessler, Dr. Kessler, uh, with us today, and so I'm going to turn it over to her, and she's <coughs> going to be talking about pseudotumor cerebri and the idiopathic intracranial hypertension form of that disorder. Anat. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be here. First of all, I want to congratulate you today. Is the Erev Rosh Hashanah is the Israeli Happy New Year's. So Happy New Year's and healthy for everyone. It's very important day. Okay, to the work. This is Tel Aviv Medical Center. You hear me? Okay. This is Tel Aviv Medical Center, a very nice place. You are all invited. I like to start with a case, unusual one. 20 years old woman, past history, she is healthy. She was hospitalized due to three weeks of severe headache and transient visual obscuration. From the last three days, she had also horizontal diplopia. When we examined her, visual acuity was quite well. There was left six nerve paresis, pupil were equal, and there was bilateral swollen disc. This is her disc. You can see both bilateral swollen with hemorrhage, optic disc. And this is the visual field. On the left, we can see the a large blind spot with nasal field defect, and on the right, the, oh, never, okay. I'll use it, and enlarge blind spots, yeah. Okay, we did a CT, and just in CT, we can see an empty delta sign, sign of venous thrombosis. Normally, you need to do CTV to see this, but in this case, it was very enlarged venous thrombosis. We, see, we saw a empty delta sign, so the diagnosis was sinus venous thrombosis. We tried, we start treated her with anticoagulant, <coughs> and diamox, and when we look in the emergency room of her blood count, we saw that we ha she had 643,000 platelets, so we looked for and we found that she had essential thrombocytosis. Later on, we found that she had mutation in, ga in the gene JAK2. So this is example of pseudotumor cerebri, secondary to sinus thrombosis, secondary to essential thrombocytosis. And so the tumor, and I will repeat this sentence a few times in the lecture, is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, it's important to remember that sinus venous thrombosis closely mimic that IIH. The incidence of sinus venous thrombosis in patients presenting only when signs of increased intracranial pressure is around 10%. MRI and MRV or CTV should be moderate neuroimaging for accurate diagnosis in all these cases. Case two is a young boy that arrived to us from other hospital. Uh, he came with the diagnosis of pseudotumor cerebri. Neurological examination were normal, except for bilateral papilledema and six <coughs> nerve palsy. CT, CTV was no, were normal. The patient underwent LP with opening pressure of 500, no cell, no glucose. Treatment with Diamox was started. This is a spoon. Papilledema, but really not so severe. One month later, we routinely do MRI to patient who diagnosed with solid tumor. We did MRI of the brain that performed subtle non-specific signal changes that in this age, the neurologists say maybe it's dysplastic changes, but to be accurate, please return in two months at the MRI. This is the first MRI, and you can see here small abnormal signal, which were non-specific. There was no enhancement. So, as I told you, we decided to repeat. 
Three months later, a single MRI demonstrated diffuse multifocal area of T2 signal abnormality in the right parietal temporal and occipital. Not brain biopsy at this point. And we consulted and decided to repeat two months later the MRI. The situation was stable. Very mild headache, very mild papill edema, and that's it, normal neurological examination. This is the third MRI, and the third MRI saw lesion in, you see here, lesion in the temporal occipital white matter, not seen here, it is better, and here and here, kind of diffuse lesion. So we refer him to stereotactic brain biopsy, and unfortunately the diagnosis become to be gliomatous cerebrum. This is the anaplastic kind of astrophytoma in very young, previously healthy old child with signs only of papilledema, normal neurological examination, and CT, and we check again the CT that we did previously was normal. So we need to remember that this lesion mas masquering tumor, and uh, even the, the CSF twice was normal, and the first CT was normal after reviewing also, just by following, we found that he had this neoplastic disorder that can mimic IIH. So I just start with these two cases <coughs> to remember that third tumor, diagnosis for exclusion, you need to think about other things. So idiopathic intracranial hypertension of pseudotumor, cerebri, what is it? First of all, a little bit of history. Pseudotumor, the name was given in, in 904 by Nonne. Then they think about benign intracranial hypertension by Follet, and we know now that it's really not so benign. Most of the patient had quite good uh, outcome, but there are a few cases with really severe visual loss. <coughs> Corbett and Thompson in 89 gave the name idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Nowadays, few people call it idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Most of the people call it pseudotumor cerebri, secondary or primary. And the primary is equal to idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So to diagnose pseudotumor, first of all, the patient needs to be allowed. There need to be signs and symptoms of intracranial pressure. No localized sign despite a uh, sixth nerve palsy. Very rarely in kids you can see also third nerve palsy. And CSF show elevated pressure, but no cell glucose normal, protein normal. No evidence in neuroimaging of tumor, mass lesion, hydrocephalus, except of, and I will speak later about this, very small signs of increasing cancular pressure. And of course, no other cause of intracranial hypertension identified. Uh, in neurology, a month ago, Friedman, Liu, and Kathleen Degree published revised diagnosis criteria of so tumor cerebri in adults and the children. And the author proposed the patient can be self divided in those with primary or secondary pseudotumor and IH and to primary. And what they suggest that Required for diagnosis is papilledema and normal neurological examination for cranial, except for cranial nerve abnormality. Normal neuroimaging, they offer to do MRI for everyone and MRV or CTV, it depends on the hospital for cases that are not so typical. We offer MRI to everyone, MRV and CTV also to everyone, of course, MRV or CTV. It needs to be normal CSF composition, and the point here, uh, the pressure. N we think about high pressure, when you think, so the tumor, the pressure needs to be over 250 millimeters of water. But what they suggest that in children, of course, in the, cubit in the right situation, the cubitus and relaxation, the pressure can be even higher. So the normal, to say, to say someone he had so the tumor cerebri, it's a, the normal pressure can be 280 millimeter. You need to remember that most of the people are sedated. So I think the 280, it's more for sedated 
and not to best and for non sedated kids the normal is 250 what is the presenting symptom of course headache the patients say this is the headache i never had severe headache and it's more than 90% of the patient transit visual obscuration very brief episode of blurred vision which may be uni or bilateral and classically participate <coughs> when there is postural changes it's around 68% pulsatile intracranial pre uh, uh, noise you forgot to ask the patient but if you ask they say oh yes i had a noise normally they came i had a headache but if you ask them correctly they say yes i had a blurred vision uh, sometimes i had a noise like tinnitus diplopia and visual loss between 10 to 30 percent the sign papilledema even severe papilledema non-predictive of visual outcome visual field it's obligatory and it's the right way to follow the patient we can see enlarged blind spot infranasal visual field and visual field constriction and of course can be also decreasing ocular motility what regarding the demographic and epidemiology the incidence of the tumor around one to two per hundred thousand in the general population but when we deal with childbearing women it the incidence it jumped to 3.5 to 4.5 although we need to remember IH occur more frequently in the adult it's occur also in the pediatric patient and we have a very big uh, pediatric pseudotumor surgery even younger than five three and two years old it's rare but it exists in 80 in, ni in 98 and 99 we checked the epidemiologic of uh, Israel of IH in Israel because Israel its country is a lot of people from other country arrived in those years so we decided to found what is the prevalence and what is the incidence and then we found when we calculate that it was really the same as it was in the state it was around 0 0.57 to 0 0.9 per 100 in the general population and the incidence jumped to 4.02 when we deal with women age 15 45 now the, the we did the epidemiology in Israel in 0507 which have, because we had the feeling there is too many pseudotumor cities. And what we found that the average annual incidence rate was 202 per 100,000. And the incidence of course was jumped in women. <coughs> and in female, during childbearing years, the incidence was 5.4 for nine per hundred thousand our findings show an increase in incidence is IH in the last decade in Israel and it's almost three times higher the rate that was found previously this finding was um, and require an immediate national action to blame the fight the obesity epidemic to reduce weight and prevent overweight among of course all age groups Obesity, <coughs> as all of you know, is the most common finding in IH. Over 90% of the women are obese. It's not that someone tell her that she is obese. They are really obese. The BMI is over 30, 35, or even more. It is known that malnutrition and weight gain was highly correlated with poor visual outcome in this patient. And the increased degree of obesity was associated with increased risk of severe visual loss. So obesity play a game here. The rule of obesity in the pathogenesis of IH is suggested by increased incidence of IH, which parallel to obesity epidemic all over the world. One hypothesis is that the visual obesity causes elevated intra-abdominal pressure, resulting in increased central venous pressure, and leading to increased intracranial pressure. So obesity usually classified by BMI, body mass index. But this measure failed to address the increasing important feature of the original distribution of adipose tissue. And specific fat distribution is often determined by measure the waist to hip ratio, which is the circumference of the waist divided by the circumference of the hip. So we speak about apple and pear. Nearly all the systemic complications of obesity, such as hypertension, diabetic, 
have been linked to visceral adiposity, central or abdominal, presumably due to unfavorable metabolic feature of the fat cell comprising the visceral fat. In contrast, genicoid obesity or low body obesity <coughs> characterized by subcutaneous fat deposition in the lower body, including the gluteal depot and lower extremity, appear not to be linked to cardiovascular complication. So we decided to characterize the obesity phenotype in IH patient. We, took, we took 44 consecutive patients in our clinic, the diagnosed with IH according to body fat identity criteria, and we used two control groups, two reference groups. One we took from the first Israeli national health and nutrition survey conducted by Israeli Ministry of Health in 1990, and the other control group was consecutive referred to obese women from the Tel Aviv Sorosky Medical Center Obesity Clinic. And this is just example, which is the hip circumference that was higher than the national serve in the IIH patient, but less than the obesity clinic. The waist that was lower in the IIH patient, and if you calculate the waist to hip ratio, it was lower in the IIH group. Waist weight circumference of IH was smaller than the control considerably, WHR was significantly higher in control compared to the IH patient. So this show us that it shifts to the left compared with the reference group. So it's consistent with what we call preferential deposit of fat in the lower body. Lower body deposit WHR less than 0.76 was seen in 45% of IH compared to only in the national survey of 2.1 and in the obesity clinic of 77. This graph show you how you divided the lower body adiposity, deposit, it's less than 0 0.76, and upper body adiposity uh, if it's over 0 0.85. And, and in this graph, you can see this, so this is the obesity clinic, the national survey, and the IH group that clearly shifted to the left compared with the two reference group. So now we decided, okay, you can see, it's not common, but you can see so the tumor also in men. So we want to know what is the obesity pattern in IH in men. It's around 10% of the patients with pseudo tumor are men. So we, we had 22 men with IIH. We compared them with control, control group that they are, came from the health program in Tel Aviv Medical Center with match for age and BMI, and also compared to our, our previous group of the female. And as just I mentioned, this is the central obesity, WHR, in men, it's over 0 0.9, in female, it's 0 0.85, and genicoid or lower body adiposity, less than 0 0.76. And it was very interesting because the men was less lower body adiposity compared to the, to the women, from the sick women, the men and the women with IH. If I we compare the men with IH to the healthy men, the men with IH has more lower body adiposity. So what we can see that the central obesity in the healthy men, it was 65%. In the male with IH, it was 45%. In the female with IH, of course, it was very less. So we conclude that, this, that the men with IH has less uh, central obesity compared with healthy men, but more central obesity compared compare with women. And we still think that IH may link to more genicoid pattern. So we say, okay, we need to continue because if the ob our observation is right, that IH is associated, associated with lower body adiposity, we wonder whether or not the presentation of IH per se or the fat distribution in IH might be linked to any unique hormonal profile. 
So we took the female that we had and we check uh, the hormonal profile. Of course, we cannot check all the hormonal profile, but we check a few of them. And what we found that there was no difference. We don't find high estradiol, for example. We expect if you have lower body adiposity that this patient will have high estradiol because it's called genic weak. No, but the only thing we found that IIH at an age younger than 25 years had higher level of testosterone, beta testosterone and mm -hmm. andro testosterone and day drops of testosterone. Increased level of circulating androgen are associated with early onset of IIH. And this finding is particularly interesting since most common well-defined form of overt hyper and androgenism in the best one is polycystic ovary. And we know it's very common to find polycystic ovary in so the tumor cerebri. But polycystic ovary will sometimes be linked to the abdominal uh, obesity. So it's raising the possibility of causal involvement of hormones such as androgen in the pathogenesis of IIH. The link of IH to androgen may also be expressed or even underlie the better recognized association of IH with drug used in the treatment of female, for example, tetracycline, rorafutan. This finding comprises sufficient, as we thought, justification for further reassessment of the role of androgen in female with IH patients. Neuroimaging. It's obligatory to do neuroimaging before <coughs> you say the patient had IH or so the tumor. My Broski in 98 determined a very slight sign, but I think very important, of sign that you can see in MR of patient diagnosed with IH. So all these signs, it's signs that help us to think maybe that this patient had IH because the result of the neuroradiologist is normal brain imaging. But if you look carefully, you can see enhancement of the perilaminar optic nerve. You can see flattening of the posterior sclera. You can see empty cella. So it's for us, and it's important that we look by ourselves after the neuroradiology gets, of course, his result. And we look for this small sign when you think maybe this patient had IH. And based on the MRI sign, the examiner can able to predict the presence of elevated intracranial pressure in more than 90%. This is example for CT, axial CT. It's normal. You can see the optic lobe. And here you see the reverse optic nerve edge. It's like you'll see the papilledema in neuroradiology. Another example, you see improved weighted image of aspin echo excel image with fat suppression, you can see anterior protrusion of the swelling of the disease with distant peri-optic peri CSF. And it's very common, we look at this and we see, oh, there is an large optic nerve, a lot of fluid, it's help for us to diagnose. We decided to establish what is the, op because we have quite a large group of cerebral tumor cerebri in kids, we want to know what is the normal optic nerve diameter and if it's really correlate with increasing the optic nerve diameter with a patient with IH. So we decided to do it with kids. We took a kids, not the kids, the picture of the kids, and we measured one centimeter anterior to the optic foramina in axial T2 sequence. And we divided the patient to four groups zero to years, three to six years, six to 12, and 12 to 18. And what we found that the mean optic nerve sheet diameter in the normal was a little bit higher with the age, but it was around three that we know this is the normal optic nerve sheet diameter. And in all the patient with IIH, there was increase in the diameter of the optic nerve sheet. And this is just example the way we measure it. The optic nerve sheet measured was 10 millimeter anterior to the optic foramen, and in this example, you can see the distent in green of the optic nerve. And if you we compare it, we can see that there was a large optic nerve sheet diameter in kids with 
study to make the radar. So the measure of the optic nerve is, we think, is an actual tool in the diagnosis of chronic dyssynthetic pressure in <coughs> pediatric patient. We think also in the adult, but we didn't do it in the adult group. Little information is available regarding psychology impact and quality of life of individual with IAH. And Clinchmate in and Kathleen de Green is, oh, sorry, was the first to look and to explore the incidence of depression and anxiety and quality of a life in IH. They checked 28 women with IH and compared them to 30 control group. And what they found that IH patients were more depressed and anxiety in the normal weight control. And there is link obesity and psychology difficulty, but obesity alone doesn't explain the depression and lower level quality of life. We are now collected our data of patients with IH. We decided to examine their cognitive function. And the purpose of the study was to evaluate this cognitive function using, I don't know if you, kn you know this technique, neurotracks <coughs> neuro test. This is a practical and technology advanced tool which provide broad profile of cognitive function have been shown precise and easy use with good weight disability and discriminate validity for mild cognitive uh, impairment. It's a computer test. The patient sit around 30 minutes. This is just, I don't want to enter into this example of the modality of the neurotext. Uh, for example, this is example from the nonverbal memory. The patient need not, uh, they show it they after four or five minutes or explain the patient and to be sure he has no understand and repeat. Then we start to show him this picture a few times and need to remember, for example, if this it's straight or it's down to the right and the left. And this is exa an, uh, another example. The executive member that he says large color stimuli are present at pseudo random interval. And the participants are instructed to respond as quickly as possible by pushing to the mouse bottom if the color stimuli is any except red. And it was interesting how we found the results. We have 30 consecutive patients, just consecutive patients that arrived to a clinic and they ag agree to participate. And this was very interesting. When when we told I told him, you know, I want to find if you, if you have any problem cognitive or if you have any problem in memory. So, oh, thank that you asked me. No one asked me this question because you know we deal with optic nerve disease. And what we found that there was significant difference from the average domain, except for memory, which was show trend toward abnormality without statistical difference. That there is decreasing a lot of cognitive function. And our results found that there was mild cognitive impairment in IH using this computer test. All the main measure apart from memory showed a statistical significant difference from normal individual, consistent with mild cognitive impairment. In the indicated there is a form of multi-domain cognitive impairment in IH. You need to remember they had high, high pressure in the brain. So it's important we start with this, we need to continue, but I think we need to ask the patient and to be, I, and, and to understand that they had <coughs> another problem despite the problem that they are very important, of course, to preserve uh, their visual function. C condition of associate, condition of prior tumor associate, they are, it's not all the list. And if you see so big list, it's mean that you don't know. I just want to mention one point of vitamin A because it was presumed by Judy Werner that high level of serum, the patient with IIH had high level of serum but lower level of CSF retinol binding protein. You need to remember most of the peop people, the women, had had hacknea and they use reocutan, and they use minocycline, they use a lot of other things and also a lot of material with a lot of vitamin A. And she suggests that the presence of unbound toxic retinol that might interfere with the pressure regulation provide evidence that vitamin A may be involved in the pathognomy of IH. And, for, and we know that we ask the patient when he 
take anamnesis from him, which medication he is taking, and the vitamin A, especially with high vitamin A, for us, it's a sign, maybe it's one of the cause of this brain tumor in this patient. But surprisingly, in the last year, two years, we had four or five children that had low vitamin A. And, uh, and we found that it was associated with pseudotumor. Two of them were autism, that they, they just eat uh, schnitzel. I don't know, I think it's schnitzel, it's uh, international word, no? They just this, uh, eat this, and uh, we found very low level of vitamin A. And uh, we now check the level of vitamin A in every patient who under 15 years old that entered to our department to see, and we were surprised there is a lot of vitamin H deficiency in this. It's not so simple because it depends on the way you check the vitamin A, but we think hypervitamin of this A, it's not good, but hypo, it's not good either. The pathophysiological mechanism of IH has been source of controversy, and at all, all the theory needs to be uh, explain several features. First of all, the predilection for obese childbearing women, lack of ventral meg megaly, and identical clinical feature from other etiology sites, such as sinus vein thrombosis. So there is a lot of etiology we think about, increased CSF production, reduced CSF absorption, associated medical disorder, intracranial renal potential. So multiple theoria, but no and unifying hypothesis. One word regarding increased CSF production. We don't think, according to the literature, that there is increased CSF production, but the first drug we use is carbonic anhydrase inhibitor. This carbonic anhydrase present in the choroid plexus and catalyze the formation of carbonic acid promoter and carbonic deficit and play an important role in the secretion of choroid fluid. It is found that inhibition of the enzyme result in inhibition of formation of CSF. Although treatment at IH is centered around decreased CSF production because we use acetazolamide, the hypothesis of overproduction has never been supported by experimental data and overproduction <coughs> of CSF seems, seems an uh, unlikely cause of this. Endocrine and metabolic dysfunction, for sure there is a connection, but we don't know yet. There is a lot of work we need to do regarding the adipose because we know there is difference between when we speak, uh, spoke about central adipositi between the type of the adipose cell, the central, and the type of the adipose cell in the lower body. You cannot speak about solitumor today without speaking about the intracranial venous hypertension. I just mentioned the king that was the first in 95 and then in ZOT. This is a group from Australia I think the, the only one who can get IRB to do this. Cer they did a cerebral venography and manometer in nine patients with IAH, and the venography show narrowing of the transverse sinus. And uh, they found that reducing the venous compression reduced the CSF pressure. Uh, Fab in neurology 03 uh, make a nice diagram of the type of the stenosis and they also used MRV to show that in 90% of IH patients there is stenosis in the transverse sinus. And nowadays, we know that transverse sinus stenosis is very, very common in every patient with IH, but we can see it also in patients without IH. And uh, one hypothesis of that, the hypothesis that maybe there is a primary abnormality in IH such as congenital narrowing of the transverse sinus. At present overt, via period later, because of things that we don't know yet, the, p the clinica began to present. Maybe underlying venous sinus abnormality create flow limiting stenosis and resultant in pressure gradient and the clinical become. Rigel in neurology 03, the clinic found the clinical cause of IH was with transverse sinus stenosis is common, as I just mentioned. The, they don't find any correlation be the, between the degree of the transit sinus stenosis and the clinical cause, including visual feed loss among patients with IH. 
suggesting that the clinical feature, not the degree of the transvaccinal stenosis, should be used to determine the management of IH, and I think it's a very important point. As I mentioned, just trans stenotic transvaccinus, the stenotic transvaccinus is very common. Whether it's the cause or the consequence, we really don't know yet. We, are, we still presume that it may lead to impaired venous outflow without reduced pressure gain in the arachnoid granulation, in the acid in reduced CCF absorption, but it's not enough data for us today. So still the answer of the chicken of the egg, the cause of IH, a lot of work, but still mystery, and the we need to continue to look for it. I think the most important thing is to, to treat and to know how to treat. The two goals of the treatment are, first of all, preserve vision, and allay symptoms of IH, particular headache, because if you had so severe headache, you cannot do anything. And optic nerve function should be carefully monitored. It includes visual field, that I think it's very important parameter, and the appearance of the fungus. Regarding OCT, that I know in the ophthalmology, every patient entered to the clinical, first of all, do OCT in Israel. I don't know how it's here. And it's not enough. It's good for follow the patient to see if there is decreasing nerve fibrillation, but I think till now the way to follow its, uh, its visual field is very important, of course, to compare all the parameters. So we want that the patient will lose his weight. It's easy to say it's very hard to do. They are very fat, and they cannot. They try, but it takes time, and it's not first line. We speak with them. We had in our clinic psychology, clinic psychology, they help them, but you know they are very, very fat. Acetazolamide, the carbonic anhydride inhibitor, that is the first drug. You need to remember that uh, this drug had a lot of side effect. It's not, you need to explain the patient. If you explain the patient, you can take the medication. They had paresthesia, they had metallic test, and they can cause this stone in the kidney, and very rarely, but it's happened, aplastic anemia. Now, in here in the state, the NIH proceed multi-center trial comparing efficacy of acetazolamide and placebo in treatment of fire age with uh, moderate visual field effect. All pa patients also treated with low sodium diet and participate in the weight loss program. And we will wait the result of this result. Because till today, acetazolamide is, the, it's, no, it's what you call a, a on over the counter uh, medication for serotonin. Topiramad, anti epileptic the drug, is also carbonic anhydrase inhibitor but less severe. You need to remember that it can cause myopia and uh, glaucoma. So, especially in the beginning, we, we check the pressure to this patient and we see a few patients that start topiramad and uh, came. Oh, I had a decrease in my vision, and the decrease in my vision was because of high intraocular pressure and not because of high intracranial pressure. Steroid, brief course of high dose steroid may be useful when there is deterioration in visual loss, but long term steroids are not routinely, we are not routinely do, do it. First of all, because of weight gain, fluid retention, and there is also debate regarding the withdrawal of steroid. Surgery. Surgery is required for fulminant onset or when the treatment, it's not enough. You do maximal treatment, but there is still deterioration in vision. You have today three options, optic nerve, optic nerve fenestration, diversion procedure like LP shunt or VP shunt, it depends on the neurosurgeon, and standing of the transvaccinus. Optic nerve fenestration, it's very elegant. Uh, it's help when there is problem with vision, but where there is an afferent pupillary defect, you're afraid there's a lot of field around the optic nerve that's compressing, and you're afraid that the patient will lose his vision. But if you have a headache, it wouldn't help. And for this, you need to do shunting. So in a lot of cases, we do medical, maximum medical treatment. There is deterioration or uh, afferent pupillary defect. You do an optic nerve shift and if it doesn't help, we do the shunting procedure. The shunting procedure, they help but there, there are a lot, a lot of side effects. There is a inflammation, there is 
stenosis of the shunt, and sometimes there is overdrainage, and you need to remember, and overdrainage can cause severe headaches. Standing uh, of the transverse venous sinus stenosis, uh, it's now in a few places they are doing it. It's endovascular venous standing. It can result in serious complications. You need to remember it. The stent can migration, can be subdural hematoma, develop of recurrent stenosis. Nowadays, it's there's no enough prospective control data, so and the result of efficacy today are inclusive, so it's not a routine, only for a special case may, can be, may also, we need to still wait for the study that we are, they are doing, I know in the state, to see the efficacy of this treatment. Regarding the outcome, the unnatural history of IH is unknown, and some, most of the people, we know it's self-limited disease, but in few people there remain, I, I increased, the, the pressure remained very high for years, and visual symptom can result, but some patients had a lot of recurrence. But in most of the case, uh, the self, there is a self-limited disease after around six years. And we check it, and we found that the most common recurrence are in the first six years. After six years, it's very unusual, but it can be. And we, off we all the time offer the patient after this period of time, just to be, be follow up. It's a one point that I want to mention, it's complication of IIH that I think not, most, most of the people don't think about, because they think IIH or papilledema loss of vision. But we, in the last years, we found four cases of spontaneous cerebrovascular otorrhea and rhinorrhea due to IIH. One case was 45 years of female, obesity with signs typical of pelodema. She had no with IH in zero. She was stable visual function and visual field, and she was really non-compliant for treatment. And then she arrived because she said, I had a headache, but the main had a, a pain in my ear, tinnitus, and autophonia. ENT examination, audiometry bera was normal. We repeat the MRI and CTV, no sinus vein thrombosis, but she say, I had autophonia. And we repeat the ENT examination, and we found pulsatile weakening on the tympanic membrane with air in the, her middle here, and, sus and was suspect to have CSF autorrhea. And this is her imaging. We can see the apex bottom still with CSF. The other case was 30, 48 female with she was obesity. All the cases with rhinorrhea was really severe obese. And she came because she had headache, but not so severe. And papilledema, and a few doctors say, maybe it's not papilledema, maybe, maybe it's not papilledema. And she came to us, and when we asked her a question, she said, yes, I had a fully fluid discharge from my left nursery. But it's nothing, for it's last for the last two months. We do LP, we examine her fluid, we, the fluid was collected for the nostril to found a positive for beta-2 transferrin. Beta-2 transferrin produced in the core plexus, and it's only found in CSF. And when we do imaging for her, we can see encephalocell entering from the cribriform plate to the ethmoid bone. So it's an extremely rare complication, but may become life-threatening if left untreated, so we need to ask the patient if they had tinnitus, if they had dripping from, his no from their nose. IH in pregnancy, you know, a lot of, I'm called, a lot of call. Oh, I had a, pregna a pregnant woman, what to do? Stop the pregnancy. Every day and at night we have a question. IH can occur at any trimester. There is no increase in maternal, fetal, neonatal mortality. Visual outcome is similar to that of non-pregnant patients with IIH. Catalin was published in 84. A controlled study demonstrated that pregnancy is not a theological factor, but still a lot of people and a lot of physicians, they are afraid, and a lot of gynecologists also. Acetazolamide, of course, it's classified as class C according to FDA, but we use it in the, to treat if we need to treat. The, there was a 
case of sacrocortical teratoma in infant born to mother that was treated with tetrotolamib, but she was treated in very, very high dose of tetrotolamib throughout her pregnancy. So we, if we need to treat a patient, we treat the patient. It depends on the, the reason if there is we're afraid we had severe papilledema, visual field load, we need to treat, we treat, and follow, it caref follow the patient carefully. IH is not by itself a specific indication for cesarean delivery. Labor may be allowed by the cesarean delivery only if there is indication, gynecological indication. There is no contraindication for Rick. Another pregnant, there is no contraindication for with, to, with IH who wish to become a pregnant, to become a pregnant. She just needs to be follow up by Merov. So in conclude, many questions remain unanswered about IH. Also, it's a common in obese female, it can occur in men, in non-obese adults, and in children. Pathophysiological study as well as clinical trials should provide more insight to this syndrome. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I agree with you, with you will excuse me that in, in the States there are, there are few people are very, very obese. I never seen such a case in Israel. But yet, you can see, if you sit out of the door of my clinic, you say, oh, this patient has for tumor. For sure, they are really obese. And uh, they increase, you know, Israel is five years later of the state. So the obesity epidemic continues, yes. There is enough obese women and men in Israel. Not everyone, you know, there is no absolute response, yes. But most of them, yes, they eat improvement when they lost their weight, yes. And they, there is recurrent when they say, oh, I eat a lot, I had 10, 15 kilograms here. Yes, I think lost weight helps for sure, most of the case, yes. So the problem that I'm asking is that most of the You know, I am, I am no, not a surgery, and I prefer to try not to do a surgery if I don't need. Because what happened with all the surgery, if they want to, the problem is in the head. The head, and we, I think we need to check if they had a problem in behavioral by eating a lot. Because they can, if they, they had an operation, some of them, after a period of time, continue to eat. If they cannot eat meat, they will eat really milkshake and, and they become again uh, fat. So I send to bariatric very rarely, only if I can, I have no success with, I, I had in my clinic the uh, psychologist and uh, nutritional to try to help them. And the, the bariatric I, I keep just for the last time. But even with this operation, it will be the new operation with the, the for gastric some of them continue to drink uh, milkshake. With milkshake, they can become like this. Yes, so the neuroradiologist that did it 
בתוך דשן, השם עם הדשן שלכם, הם ינששו ועשתה של דה קונטרול, הקדישו דשן אין את דשן, אין לי דשן, ותוך פרק אמבולי שמור, שוב, the same sequence and the same, I don't know the word in English, and the same plane, there was no angulation because we choose the point that there is no angulation is straight, so you can compare it with the distance of 10 millimeters. Yes, yes. Exactly. We check a lot of, of uh, other planes of the MRI. And we decided this is the right way to compare it. Otherwise, why? It's the angulation we compare it. Yeah, yeah. Change. It's a wonderful question. I don't have an answer. We just found this. We don't even publish it yet because we were surprised. Now, first of all, we need to continue to check it. And then we need to check this patient after treatment, after the AH will pass, and then to change. Thank you for the question. Change. Okay, <laughs> thanks. I think it's, it's quite obligatory that you ha we have papilledema. There is what we call third tumor without papilledema. But it's very complicated, you will excuse me, because if you check a patient with migraine and you can check the pressure, you can see a high pressure. So we had a IIH? No. So I think it's very rarely, and we see very rarely, IIH patient with normal papilledema, with normal optic disease, and if we see that the optic disease is normal, we say maybe it's other disease, because migraine headaches, and we see a lot of migraine headaches that arrive, you may be pressure, you can have a, a high pressure. So, but maybe subtly in the right. <laughs> well, I, I wanted to say that in that article that you just published, you were trying to come up with other criteria, so I think what the picture of palsy in the number of factors in the gap Normal pressure is pretty conservative. Uh, you know, and then you said it, you know, a healthy woman can diagnose is pretty conservative. Every single person that has a headache has either normal pressure or high pressure in the pool. You've got to put, you got to put some limit on it. And, and so, um, and in our series, uh, it was very interesting. Another thing, you know, this is a pseudo tumor. So it will be pseudo pseudo tumor. It's too much. I'm very polite. You will excuse me. I need to speak in English. I was born in Israel, and I'm afraid I will make so many mistakes. Well, I, I wasn't speaking no, no, it's fine. No, I, 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 it's a, I, I can't trust you. I sit with a, a patient and say, you know, you're overweight. You know, in this disease, you need to lose the weight because I show you, if you lose the weight, you will be better. Uh, with un, un with them one by one, they cry and explain it. They, they will say, yes, you can say to me, I'm very obese. And, but I'm very polite because I think to, and there are some physicians do it, uh, they, they wait, please go here, see what did you wait. No, I have, but then I say to them to wait to see uh, the, all the, me the, me the measure of the BMI. <laughs> and then I say to see, you need to lose the vision, but I'm very polite. 
אני לא כלי עזר עם ריקוליים. Ah, this is, I agree with you 100%. <laughs> no, because you don't want, that, especially with the younger one, because of the anorexia, and you know the, there is one patient of mine that she decided to lose the way, and she became anorexic. So I am I'm very careful. I don't want that, and I explain them, I don't want that you starve yourself. I just want two, three kilo a month very, very, very slowly if I deal with 100 and more. tough cases. We see it's very unopen, but it, it's entered through the what we call fulminant pelvic tumor. We had a very few cases in the last year. They are not totally blind, but they, if they see a, a light perception or cyst, uh, cyst field, they are almost blind or constrict in the we had it. And it's very hard. We treat them as fast as possible. What we do, uh, what we did, especially they arrive just with deterioration in vision. So they arrive, in my experience, with severe deterioration in vision, also in the vision field, and also with most of them in atrium superior vision. We do ophthalmotic penetration immediately if there is no uh, response after 24 hours of uh, AP shunt. And we treat them in between with steroids for very short period of time. But I will find that in the, this, these tough cases, for short period of time to do steroids, you know it takes time to the operation, to, it helps. It helps to arrest it. You do need to do it very, very fast. Melted off quickly with the vacuum penetration done right away and then for the eye surgeons, uh, both of the shots, they shot the drug right away and used the drug for the scalp healing. But, um, but you know, that's still uh, a procedure that is not going to last that long and has a very serious complications. to come to the clinic, mm -hmm. not in the acute form, because mm -hmm. if the acute form, the result of surgery is no, but all the patients was in literally state of the disease, but not with severe headache, because with severe headache, you cannot do it. And regarding the weight loss, I start to speak about the weight loss after I treat the headache, mm -hmm. the, they become better, and then we, we treat and 